This episode of All About the Gear is brought to you by BorrowLenses.com. All right, folks, welcome back to another exciting episode of All About the Gear. I'm here with my good friend, Mr. Doug Kay, who has had the good fortune of putting together a um, review about a camera that we talked about on This Week in Photo a couple weeks ago. It's one from Nikon, and it's the Nikon DF. And now, on the show, if you watch This Week in Photo, I said some pretty interesting things about the DF, and uh, hopefully Doug will put all that to rest and tell us how good this camera body is. So Doug K, all about the gear, the DF, what is up with that camera? Yeah, as I said, Frederick, this is going to be a what's up with that show. This is the Nikon DF. It is, um, it's a very unusual camera, let's say that. And we could spend probably a lot of time trying to come up with another set of words for what DF stands for. Uh, Nikon, I think, refers to it as digital fusion. And digital fusion. Digital fusion. I don't know what that means, but uh, I just want to read you a couple of quotes from their marketing brochure, and this will say a lot about this camera. They say in part... To, this will allow you to rediscover the fulfillment of measured, deliberate photography and create your pictures one frame at a time. Also, this allows you to, uh, you'll be choosing unhurried inspiration over the frantic rush of speed and efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> you, you are un, we are unencumbering you with that overhyped convenience type thing. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Who needs right. convenience? We are introducing right. complexity and hard to use itness into our cameras. I, I love reading that one between the lines. I mean, yeah. that is. I mean, read I didn't that like one it. more time. That's, for a read that, that one more time. The second one. The second yeah, one is good. The second one. And and choosing unhurried inspiration over the frantic rush of speed and efficiency. <laughs> and you know, I got to tell you. For better or worse, they are absolutely right, and we'll get into that. Let's let's talk about what this puppy is. That looks All like right. a that looks like so, an old school like a <laughs> F3 that I used to shoot with. That's that's the idea behind it. This is uh this is the Nikon DF and it is uh supposed to be retro. You can get this by the way with the all black look like this or you can get it with the silver top. Mm -hmm. Um it's a $2750 body only. Mm. Um which means it's pricey. Yeah. But it is an awesome camera from the point of view of quality. And the reason is that this has the same sensor as the Nikon D4. That's a $6,000 camera. Mm -hmm. So the image quality is every bit as good as the D4. 16 megapixel. Uh, that camera costs, I think I said, six six thousand dollars. So, so it's a bargain then, right? It's it is a bargain. Less than half the price. Yeah. Um of, of a D4. Uh the image quality, the low light performance. It's a night vision camera. Mm -hmm. The um, uh, the the high ISO performance in terms of noise, terrific. Um, and the one of the big pushes for this camera, the reason it has this whole retro look, is Nikon launched this camera to allow people to use some of the older non AI lenses. We'll talk a little bit about what that means, but lenses that are made as early as 1956, essentially for the F mount. Okay. Okay. So then, yeah, I want to talk about the lenses a little bit because I have a bunch of old F-mount lenses that are retro looking and I could theoretically put them on that. So b before we go into the lens thing, so overall, the, the top line, when people look at this camera, they're like, okay, it's a new camera body from Nikon. What you just said, or is that the, the you know, is that the, the main thrust of the, the camera? I mean, is the fact that it looks retro and I can put my old lenses on it, is that the main selling proposition? And it's simple and unencumbered with speed. <laughs> uh, simple, no. It's a very complicated camera. Uh -huh. But, you know, I can, I can see what happened is that something got lost between the marketing department, the, the product marketing department, and the engineering department. Product marketing said, we want to have a camera that takes advantage of the retro trend that people are doing with things like micro four-thirds cameras. Yeah. Uh, we want something that allows for a more deliberate process. Well, they meant that in a positive way. I think engineering said, well, let's make a camera that's harder to use. And let's make, things, let's make controls that are really awkward. Yeah. Uh, so somehow things got lost in translation is all I can imagine. I bet. Well, let's talk about the lenses. So the 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 lenses. That's I mean that's a huge plus, right? Having a this 
a cheap sensor, or not cheap, but a, an amazingly good sensor, inexpensive in a new body that I can use all my old lenses on. I can use the F-mount lenses and all that. But I can do that with all the Nikon bodies, right? I mean, that's the, one of the whole things about using Nikon gear. I can use the F-mount is on every piece of gear that Nikon makes that's in the, in the DSLR space. Well, it's not quite true because, in fact, there are a, there's one significant difference in what Nikon has done over the years. And let me give you a look at it. Here, I'm going to take this lens off here, and I want to show you this little tab here. In most of the modern cameras, this little tab right there is used to indicate some things about the aperture. And in this camera, it allows you to fold that down. And when you fold that down, you get compatibility with cameras that uh, with lenses that you don't otherwise have. That that little thing is really the big difference here. I know it doesn't seem like much. Yeah. So let's take a moment to talk about what's really going on here. One of the things we never talk about is how DSLRs, Canons, Nikons, and so forth, actually work when it comes to their lenses. Those lenses, when we stop them down, the aperture doesn't actually close. We actually the aperture stays wide open so that we have the most amount of light for focusing, but it also means that the metering is done with the lens wide open, even though the picture is going to be taken with the lens stopped down. Okay. And that means that the lens has to communicate to the camera a couple of things. First of all, what is the aperture when it's wide open, and what will the aperture be when the le lens stops down to take the picture? And the little tabs and things like that between the lenses and the bodies are what tell that to the, uh, to the camera. And in the older cameras, that was strictly a mechanical thing. In the more modern camera, that's done electronically. So when you put an old lens on this camera, if you don't want to use the metering, it's really not an issue. You go to manual mode, you set the aperture, you take the picture, and you get what you want. But if you want to use the built-in metering of the modern DSLR with an old lens, uh, you have to go through some, you have to jump through some hoops. You have to go into the menu system. You have to say what the maximum aperture for the lens is. Mm -hmm. You may have to say uh, what the uh, aperture is going to be when you shoot so that the metering system can compensate for that. Remember, it's metering with the lens wide open, knowing full well that when you actually take the picture, the lens is going to stop down. Right. Right. Now, so all that configuration on a per lens basis, is that something that you can program or configure like you can on some cameras that you can, you know, set custom settings so that I know, you know, these are my three manual lenses that I always use and, and I don't want to be digging through the menu every time I swap to this lens. Can I put a, a hot button or some kind of pre-configuration so that I can quickly get to that setting when I swap to that lens? I don't think you can get there too quickly. I think you, you might be able to to you know, configure one of the buttons. I'm not quite sure about that. But the fact is, to use that, you have to go into the menus and set it up once. And it'll store a handful of lens settings. I forget the exact number. Mm -hmm. So you can do that. And then depending on the type of lens, the lens may or may not communicate current aperture, or I should say desired aperture. So there are a few different variations on the theme. And I played with this whole set of lenses, about a dozen different old lenses from uh, a gorgeous 15 millimeter all the way up to a 1,000 millimeter reflex lens. Yeah, uh, cool. And and uh, you know, got them all to work one way or another. But for me, I ended up shooting most of the stuff in manual. Some of those really long lenses have fixed aperture. They might just be an f/8 or even an f/11 lens. Period, with yeah. nothing adjustable. Now, would so, you before we move on? Because I want to I want to flip this to positive. But before we move on, we. we I mean, I know there's a lot of legacy lenses out there. I have some of them, you know, that that I'd want to use on this body if I was to buy it. But in if if we look forward instead of backward, from your perspective, should photographers be, you know, making those concessions to just squeeze out more life from the legacy in, le lenses, or should they instead just say, you know what, I'm this is 2014 and beyond. I'm gonna buy the latest lenses that can communicate, they have CPUs in them, they're faster autofocusing, all this stuff. I'm going to buy the state-of-the-art technology for my state-of-the-art body instead of living in the past. What do you think about that? Well, I, I think the the audience for the camera is people who already have the lenses. I don't expect yeah, people to rush right. out and buy old lenses. Yeah. Uh, but a friend of mine who I, I spent some time with for this review has this amazing collection of old lenses, and yeah. that's what allowed me to really run these tests. Um, and there are some very unique old lenses, and some of them are some of them are awful. There are some old lenses that you know 
there's a 200 to 600 zoom that's just makes horrible images <laughs> but but you know it's out there but there's also a 500 millimeter reflex lens that is incredibly sharp mm. incredibly beautiful contrast and because it's a reflex lens it's very compact um, so uh, you know there there are two markets for this and we can talk about that in terms of you know do you want do you need a camera for your old lenses this is it do you need a camera that has a great sensor at half the price of the uh, D4? This is it also. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, there, there are two, two use cases, I guess you'd say, for this. Cool. Well, let, let's talk about the positives of this. So, I know you, you, how long have you had that camera? Like two, two weeks or so? I've had the camera almost three weeks, uh, thanks to our friends at borrowlenses.com. Uh, they gave me a nice long time to work with it, and I took advantage of it quite a bit. Awesome. Thank you, Borrow Lenses. So, what what good came of it? You know, I mean, what? Tell me the tell me the the glasses half full look at the Nikon DF. Okay, the half full is that the image quality is spectacular. It is the same sensor, the same processing, I believe, as the D4. So it's a beautiful image. I mean, there's you know, it's just terrific. I shot in, I shot in the dark with this thing. I went to the Exploratorium and took pictures where I couldn't see what was going on inside a, a darkened movie theater and got terrific exposures all in focus. So yeah. uh, it is, you know, anybody who's worked with a D3S or a D4 knows what I'm talking about. It's a great camera. Um, it also has uh, the level of weather sealing that you'd get with a D800. It's not up to D4 level weather sealing, uh, but pretty good. Uh, decent battery life. But the main thing, the main benefits of this are, A, the ability to use those legacy lenses, and B, the extraordinary image quality. Really? So that's the good stuff. Okay, that's it? That's all That's all the good that you can think of? Well, it's pretty good. I mean, it is, it's, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is he, you're struggling. Doug is struggling to think of the positive, you know. <laughs> you know. Okay, so what I, are the negatives? What are the problems with this camera? I mean, from my perspective, and we talked about this on this week in photo, I think. I'm not sure if you were on that episode when we were when it first came out, but my issue was there it's missing stuff and you're paying a lot of money for it, you know. And you're going to I think you're going to talk about some of the stuff that it's missing, but that was my main issue is like like you said in that opening phrase from their marketing materials, they they're, they're spinning the fact that it doesn't have complexity as a good thing. And I personally, you know, I kind of want that complexity. <laughs> I want to make the choices of what features I want to use. I don't want the camera to make the choice for me. So what, what did you find? Well, this is where I think the message got lost between product marketing and engineering because this camera is not simple. It's very complex. Mm. And uh, in terms of what's missing, I mean, where to start? Let's let's just take a look at something here, first of all. Um, oh, gosh, the first thing is, <laughs> I, I, it's it's an, you're like where to start? <laughs> yeah, it's it's an ergonomic disaster. Oh, um, it is. I don't know of many cameras that I've reviewed, and I've done quite a few now. Yeah. Uh, that were so difficult to use. First of all, this grip on the side is tiny. I mean, you you. You can't grip it. It's not big enough for a, d a normal size hand. Yeah. My hands aren't all that big. So that's the first problem. Um, the second problem is, all right, it looks cool, but the controls are a mess. I mean, to give you an idea, starting over here, you've got your, your control for manual, aperture priority, shutter priority, and... Um, program mode. Well, that locks, but this one, you pull it up and you turn it to unlock it and make it move. Let me get my hand out of the way so you can see that. So you turn it up, pull, pull it up and turn it, right? I'd hate to have to do that with gloves on. I'd, have, I'd hate to have to oh, use this yeah. camera with gloves on, period. A little fingertippy kind of thing. Yeah. Power switch, there's no little lever on the front here. You have to turn a knob for the power switch. Oh. The front dial, you know, that we usually have for, um, you know, aperture control, let's say, yeah. would be right here. Right. Yeah. This control is actually mounted vertically, if you can see it, and you have to That's turn aperture? It. That's I thought aperture that was like mount. a PC sink cover no, thing or something. No, no, no. This is like the aperture control. You can roll it with your fingertips, sort of. You get used to it. Now, here's where, here's where it gets bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, oh, that's not bad, but wait, there's more. <laughs> there's more. This is the shutter speed dial, right? And you may think, cool, for, oh, first of all, it... it, it it sort of locks. I mean, it's unlocked until you go to a certain setting, and then you can't turn it, and you can push the button and lock it. So everything that locks, locks differently. Every knob that has a lock has a different concept behind it. So this shutter speed dial has one problem. 
in that it only has full EV stops. So you can go to a 500th or a 1,000th, but you can't dial in anything between a 500th and a 1,000th of a second. To do that, you have to go to the setting called one-third stop, and then you use the dial in the back like you do on a modern DSLR. Oh, okay. So it's got b weird stuff. But but wait, there's more. Uh. If you if you shoot in aperture priority mode, this just ignore this dial. Because if you have this set to a 500th of a second and you're at aperture priority, the camera's picking the shutter speed and this dial is irrelevant. Oh jeez. <laughs> now, you know, that's it's just crazy. And okay. The, well, the, the fact is that you know we've seen cameras that do it right. Fuji is the one who gets these controls perfect, I would say. But these guys don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That looks. I mean, like, yeah, like you're saying, this the idea of it being simple, just from that two minutes that you explained that right side of the camera is gone out the window. This looks like one of those cameras that you're going to need to marinate with for a month or two on assignment somewhere so you can build up the muscle memory on how to use it and then forget about every other camera because it doesn't match, right? Yeah, I'll just give you one more example of this. I mean, here's the ISO dial. Great. Now, it locks too. Well, this has a different kind of button. You hold down this one to unlock and then you can rotate it. But, but what does the ISO dial mean if you're in auto ISO mode? I don't know. I think it might be the minimum or the maximum or something like that. But, you know, who wants to take out the manual every time you want to shoot with the damn thing? Right, right. So, Jeez. anyway, you know, we could go on and on. The fact is that it is a strange camera with with uh, weird weird ergonomics. And, um, uh, that, you know, that's, that's strange. I, you know, if, if you can get used to the grip or if you're going to use it on a tripod, if you're going to use some of these legacy lenses, you'll probably shoot on a tripod quite a bit anyway. Yeah. But if you're going to do that, then you can adjust to it. You can learn how to use it. I did over a period of time, but that doesn't mean I ever actually liked it. It just got it just got you just weird. figured it out. You yeah. figured it out. Yeah. 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 You know, and I, so you saw that F stoppers video, right? Was it was it from F stoppers oh. that they did on the DF? Oh god, that was that was a spectacular <laughs> review. That that may be the the world's best video. Should we link to that? We got to link to that. People, if you haven't seen that, you definitely have to watch that video. It's very well produced. It's perfect. But he doesn't go into the specs. He goes in more more of the the aesthetics of the retro looking camera versus a black camera. And he's yeah. like, man on the street, which one do you like better? The retro looking camera or the black one? Oh yeah, clearly the retro one is better than the black camera. <laughs> so it's crazy. And without giving it away, he made some serious personal sacrifices to do that review. He did well, some he, body well, modification, <laughs> let's just say. He did some body modification for a review. So, yeah, so <laughs> as a companion to this, go read that. Go see that video. It's terrific. So, Doug, I, I alluded to missing stuff from this. So we see there's a lot of stuff added and complexity piled on. What's been taken away? Well, there are a couple of things. One is um, minor, but I wish it, wish it had the one eight thousandth, eight thousandth of a second shutter speed. Yeah. This is only... Uh, a four thousandth of a second. By the way, via the knob, you can only get as slow as four seconds. You can get to thirty seconds through the menus. But you know what? It's just crazy that you do something with the dials, but to do anything serious, you got to say, "Oh, ignore the dial." Right. Um, a mm -hmm. little disappointing on the autofocus. They use the autofocus system not from the D4, uh, but from the D7000 and D600 class cameras. Now, mm -hmm. to be honest, you know, they've got to keep something out of the features. They, if they make the camera every bit as good as a D4, no one's going to buy a D4. Yeah. And uh, in this case... Um, Unless they want speed and ease of use. <laughs> right. <laughs> in this case... Oh, you know, it does weigh a lot less than a D4, which is... Does it? Another advantage. Yes, it does. It's, uh, it's, it, it competes. It's around the same weight as a D600, the same size as a D600. So it's really light compared to that. The, the hey, maybe D4. that's a brilliant marketing ploy by Nikon, Doug. I was just thinking about that. It's brilliant. Make a really, really overly complex camera and then make it cheap. And then if people want simplicity, they have to pay. So <laughs> right. you, want, you really want simplicity, then you pay You you know the real non-retro camera. If you really want to take pictures and maybe, not just look cool. Maybe that's it. Maybe people get this and they say, God, I want an awful camera, but if I spend twice as much money, I can solve all the problems. I can Something actually take like pictures. That. It'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a couple of other things. Uh, the frame rate is only five and a half frames per second uh, okay. when you're doing uh, autofocusing between shots, and that's 10 frames a second on the D4. Um, it's not a very good camera for manual focusing. Um, 
there's really the, the only thing you can do for manually focus is go into live view mode, uh, but there's no focus peaking, for example. But you know, none of the DSLR, very few of the DSLRs that we see have focus peaking. Yet. Well, like the the old school F4 that I mentioned has a split screen prism in right. there. Does this have that in there? It does not, and I don't believe you can change the screens. I, I don't mm. believe that's a possible thing on this mm. camera. Uh, but uh, it has no flash. It has a hot shoe, but no flash. And because it's a retro but still to camera. To be fair, it's a DSLR, so most pro-level DSLRs don't have pop-up flashes. That's I mean, true. you get down to the APS-C, like the, the, the D7000, those, that class cameras, those have flashes on them, but right. not the not this level. And I'm putting this, I would push this up into the F4 kind of range of, of bodies, right? Right. But yeah. as you pointed out for one of our other reviews, I believe it's it's nice to have flash just as a controller for the other units. You know, right. using the the Nikon uh, flash system, for example. Yes. In this case, yes. you'd have to add on a strobe or a controller to do that. Yeah, which is three hundred plus four hundred dollars for a controller, or six or seven hundred dollars for an additional speed light. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So, and of course, it's a retro still camera, and that means no video. So we don't have to do a video review. There is no video in the camera. No there. video. See, that blows me away. That, like, why? <laughs> I don't understand why you can just throw video in there. I well, mean, I think, again, it's product differentiation. It's trying to say, how is this different from, I mean, you know, we, we review these cameras, and the cameras are amazing these days. I can barely yeah. keep up with some of the advances. Right. But you want to say, Boy, if everybody would just put all the great things together, we would have an amazing camera. But each camera has is better about something, worse about something else. Yeah. And in and this like case, tables with one of the legs is one of the legs is always <laughs> a little bit too short, right? right. Yeah. In this case, no video. So that you know, if you want video, this isn't your camera. It's an easy decision. It's not yeah. a matter of poor quality video. It ain't there. It ain't there. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and of course, uh, you know, the LCD isn't tiltable. Uh, and there's no Wi-Fi, so we don't have to worry about Wi-Fi or NFC or mobile apps or anything. Which like is, that. I mean, those those two things right there. The tilt, the the not having a tiltable or articulated LCD on the back, I could get past that because none of my other DSLRs have that. Um, but if you're coming to this camera from, say, a GH3 or the new GH4 that has that fully articulated screen on there, you get used to that. So. That's one thing, but the unforgivable sins I think are no video and no Wi-Fi. I could I could even forgive the no NFC because not every phone or tablet has NFC built into it, so I can understand not one to put the money into that. But no Wi-Fi on this thing. I'm I'm more and more as the weeks go by integrating Wi-Fi more and more into my workflow, and it's like I need to have it. I need to be able to shoot and look at it on my phone or my tablet and send it out right there without messing with camera connection kits and USB and all that stuff. It's just boom, boom, and I'm gone. So, I mean, why, Doug, devil's advocate, why not put it in there? Uh, because Wi-Fi was invented after 1956. <laughs> you know, and, and this is this is a camera that, you know, I, I was trying to describe it to my wife as I was shooting with this, I said, it's like having a car with an automatic transmission, but there's a clutch pedal that you have to step on in order to get it out of park. Yeah. You know? Not to, not to mention that it has doesn't have power windows or anything like that. No GPS, of course. No, it's this, crazy. This, yeah. this, this camera would, would have power windows, but it, it, you would have a crank. <laughs> and so you'd have to crank the window down unless you wanted the window to go down all the way, and then you'd have to push the power button. You know, it's 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 crazy. It's just crazy. But I I like the I like the metaphor of the clutch in the automatic transmission in order to shift out of park. So I love it. So anyway. okay, so the big question is, which I always ask at the end of these reviews, who's this for? I mean, who who who's the target market for this? Is it the hipster? Is it the person? Is it the you know the 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 guy or or woman that has all these Nikon lenses from over the years and they want to get some more life out of them? Who's it for? You know, that's usually a difficult question to answer because it's hard to create. You know, there are multiple profiles. In this case, that's actually a really easy question to mm. answer. I think it is obviously for someone who wants to use the old lenses, particularly if they want to use the camera metering. Yeah. Uh, if they want to use non-AI lenses or AI lenses that have that spe use that special tab, this is the only digital camera that's going to work with them. That is without an adapter. Remember, you could always take some of those lenses, stick an adapter on them, and put them on 
you know, a Sony A7 or a Fuji or a Micro Four Thirds. That's another yep. alternative, right? Yep. Yep. Um, the other is somebody who really wants the quality of a D4 because this has all the image quality, but at half the price and is willing to put up with the problems of this camera because uh, image quality wise it's got it it's just not a very nice camera to use so if you can put up with those deficiencies this will be a great camera for you it's an um, angry camera it's well angry. it's it's like, you don't want to use me I'm not gonna make it easy for you to take pictures you know I had an old Nikon F and I never I never found it to be angry I never I had never had an adversarial relationship with my old Nikon yeah me um, this this in fact I fell in love with Nikon because of my F3 yeah, this camera is is uh, you get angry at this one, you know, you really do. It's but, an angry camera. I, now I and I want to put a plug in here, not for borrow lenses, not because they they underwrite the show, they sponsor us. Thank you very much, borrow lenses. They've given me this camera for three weeks, um, but because you really need to use this camera before you buy it, mm -hmm. you need to go out and um, rent it. Or borrow it and not just for a few hours you need to have a couple of days to shoot with this to really understand all of its quirks and decide whether it's the camera you want I've I've never had such a strong recommendation for people that they need to try before they buy on this one yeah like like for example your when you got your your Sony a7 that was a mail-order bride right because you were just <laughs> exactly. like you bought it and it showed up and it was yours this one you're saying you might want to date for a week or two before you jump the broom right Perfect metaphor. Yes. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the mail or bride. Cool. Awesome, Doug. So, what's next? That's a perfect review. Thank you for that. I think you know anybody that's been on the fence or considering this. I think the takeaway for the the Nikon DF is it's a challenging camera that has lots of quirks to it. If you are, if you really want to be serious about well, getting this camera, rent it from Borrow Lenses first. Go get it. Play with it you know, and shoot with it, send it back, and then make your decision. But it's not one of those, just go play with it in the camera store and then buy it, right? That's right. That's right. You have to use it. Yeah, you got to use it. Well, cool, Doug. All right, what's what's coming up next? Uh, oh. the next some of the, the next episodes of uh, All About the Gear. We've got some great stuff. We have, uh, hold it up right here. We have the Olympus OMDEM-1. Oh. I can't wait to talk about that. We, right. we did a show last night as we record this. Um, Ron Brinkman, you know Ron, right? I Ron, do. Ron Brinkman just bought one of those and made the jump. Not only did he make the jump into being a married guy, but he also made the jump into Micro Four Thirds with the Olympus EM1, and he said he couldn't be happier on both so, fronts. So Ron really is no longer dating. He's no longer dating. <laughs> no longer dating. All right. Cool. And, so we got the uh, M1 coming. What we else? We got that. I got cameras all. I'm surrounded by cameras here. Uh, we've got the Lytro camera. We're gonna do. That's a that's a interesting one. All right. I want to hear about uh, that. And and I hope Sony's listening. I want them to send us an A6000. We need one of those. I I asked them for on your behalf yesterday, right. Doug, and Thank I don't you. know. I'm still pushing, but my the word that they told me was they could get us one by the end of March. That's that might that might work. That might okay. Work. All right. Uh, so anyway, a lot of good stuff coming up, Frederick. Awesome. All right, Doug. Well, thanks again. Perfect. I uh, you know this is uh this is therapy for the what's the acronym that you use for people that have. Gear acquisition syndrome. GAS, gear yeah. acquisition syndrome. <laughs> Duck, Doug K, the the remedy for your GAS. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Doug. I appreciate. Okay. It. Talk All to right. you soon, Frederick. Thanks a lot. See you next time.